Welcome to today's live stream Lasker Lessons in Leadership. This is the 15th installment of this lecture series, which is a collaboration between the Lasker Foundation, the International Biomedical Research Alliance, and the NIH Oxford Cambridge Scholars Program. These lectures aim to provide strategies for developing leadership skills, stimulate a sense of leadership responsibility, and encourage trainees and tenure-track faculty to seek out opportunities to be leaders in their biomedical research careers. My name is Hallie Geitch. I'm an MD-PhD candidate and an NIH Gates Cambridge Scholar. And my name is John Hancock. I am an MD-PhD candidate and an NIH Cambridge Scholar. It is a pleasure to be coming to you for today from the Stanford University School of Medicine here on the beautiful Stanford campus. It is my honor to begin by introducing Dr. Michelle Manje, Manje Disroth. Dr. Manje Disroth received her MD and PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University and completed her residency training in neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School Partners Program and then returned to Stanford for a clinical fellowship in pediatric neuro-oncology. Dr. Uh, Dr. Manjay Dysroth is a professor of neurology at Stanford University and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical School, Medi uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She's a leader in neuro-oncology credited with discovering the neuron glioma synapse, igniting the field of cancer neuroscience. Her focus Research focuses on the intersection of neuroscience, immunology, and brain cancer biology. Her group studies the regulation of healthy glial precursor cell proliferation, new oligodendrocyte generation, and adaptive myelination. The Manjay lab discovered that neuronal activity promotes the progression of malignant gliomas, driving glioma growth through both paraconfractors and through electrophysiologically functional neuron to glioma synapses. Dr. Manjay's research spans from basic molecular studies to clinical trials. Her work has been recognized with numerous honors, including an NIH Director's Pioneer Award, a MacArthur Fellowship, the Richard Lonsbury Award from the National Academy of Sciences, and an election to the National Academy of Medicine. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next guest, Dr. Carl Dysroth. Dr. Dysroth earned his undergraduate degree in biochemical sciences from Harvard University, then his MD and PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University. Remaining at the Stanford University School of Medicine, he then completed his postdoctoral training, medical internship, and psychiatry residency. In his current position as the Stanford D.H. Chen Professor of Bioengineering and of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, he is best known for his extraordinary contributions to neuroscience in the form of new technologies to study neural circuits and neural function. His lab is responsible for the creation and development of optogenetics, in which elegant optical and genetic strategies are combined and applied to study normal neural circuit function, as well as dysfunction, in neurological and psychiatric disease. Additionally, the Dyseroth lab pioneered the use of hydrogel tissue chemistry, including the technology known as Clarity, a tissue clearing method that transforms intact tissue into a nanoporous hydrogel hybridized form that is fully assembled but optically transparent and permeable to macromolecules. His prolific work has resulted in his inductions into the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, and National Academy of Medicine, as well as countless prestigious awards, including, of course, Alaska Award in 2021. Dr. Dysroth's work entered the literary realm with the 2021 publication of his highly acclaimed book, Projections, A Story of Human Emotions, in which he explores the intricacies of the human condition through clinical stories, poetic descriptions of basic science discoveries, and memoir. I'd highly recommend it to all students listening today. Dr. Manje and Dr. Dysroth's careers are models of what can be achieved when a spirit of intense curiosity and wonder is applied to the bridging of basic scientific research with clinical care of some of the most difficult to treat conditions known to modern medicine. Thank you for joining us today, both of you. We look forward to an inspiring and illuminating conversation. A few quick points to the audience. Thank you for your attention today. As time allows, we will be taking questions using the chat function of the live stream at the conclusion of the interview. We have so much to get to, so I'll begin with our first question. Both of you have these extraordinary bodies of work that really bridge the gap between clinical medicine and basic science. How would you say that your clinical work has sort of influenced your research and vice versa? And also, what advice do you have for students who wish to pursue truly translational research in the future? 
I would say that you know our clinical experiences, I, I think I can speak for both of us, have really inspired and focused our, our basic research activities. And for me, my patients you know, really inspire the questions that need to be answered and help generate hypotheses about you know, what, what might be underpinning their disease processes. And then you know, the, the wonderful thing about being a clinician scientist is the ability to go back to the lab to test those hypotheses to, to really search for better approaches for diseases that have you know, no good therapeutic options or insufficiently good therapeutic options and then take that back to the clinic. Yeah, it's so helpful to have the ability to bring that ground truth back to your students in the lab. Not everybody is going to get a medical degree. Not everybody needs to get a medical degree. But for us to be able to share what really matters, what really happens with the human beings who are suffering, it's not just a list of symptoms. Here's, here's what's really affecting their life. Here's how it matters. Maybe here's how we can study it. That's so that's such a helpful foundation for the lab, for the students. and, and I think for both of us, that's, that's really important to be able to guide our, our research lab. But it, it goes the other way, too. It's, it's funny, the, the lab actually guides, in many ways, how I can talk to my patients. I have, when I, I, I'm a psychiatrist, I treat patients with uh, uh, severe depression, treatment-resistant depression, and also with autism. And the insights that come from the lab actually help me talk to the, to the patients. I can think in real physical terms about what's going on in their mind and it, it guides and focuses my clinical care yeah. in interesting ways. And to echo that, you know, I take care of children with typically fatal um, uh, pediatric you know, cancers of the brain and spinal cord. And being able to share what's happening in the lab that we don't have sufficient answers yet, but we and others are working really hard on it, is comforting. And, and families really engage with that in a, in, a, in a way that I think provides some hope and, and kind of become partners with us as we you know, try to find answers to these diseases. Many families I've cared for, you know, for, for whom I've cared for their children have stayed very, very engaged in, in understanding what's happening in the lab. Yeah, that's a, a great point to bring up. I'm sure that for the families of especially children with DIPG, for instance, yeah. um, actually being able to see you as a clinician and also a scientist, seeing you kind of working on both sides is probably sort of a source of maybe some hope, maybe some comfort, but yeah, yeah, the, the hope devastating is a, diseases. Right. It's, and, and the patients and the families, hope is, is a big deal. They, they're, they know that we're not going to be able to bring the research findings immediately to help the person who's in the clinic right away. But it still matters so much for them to know that it's hope that this is not yeah. the end of the, the road. And, and to hear it could be five years, it could be 10 years, 20 years, that's OK for the families. They just need to, to know it. And, and to know that they're part of the journey and that they're contributing to the research in incredibly important ways. I mean, I, it, it should be pointed out that most of the progress in DIPG and other, um, you know, high-grade and aggressive you know, pediatric brain cancers has happened because of families and patients donating tissue, donating um, you know, other kinds of clinical information, and then staying engaged with the research. They've really pushed the field forward. And the hope might not be for their child, but it's, it's a hope that their child's disease and, and struggles will contribute to helping future children. So, you know, very much a kind of team effort with patients and with the lab. And we have patients and their families come and visit the lab pretty frequently. It's really, I think, an important part of achieving closure and, and seeing some meaning in what is otherwise a, a difficult to imagine tragedy. The next question is, has to do with interdisciplinary science. I personally have been very impressed with the, looking at your work for both of you that you're able to collaborate with lots of different people doing lots of different types of research from lots of different backgrounds. How do you manage that? Do you have any advice about how to lead these large projects? Humility is important. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we had the answers, then I would have treatments for all of my patients, and I don't. And so I seek diversity of perspective mm -hmm. and collaboration um, in our own work and um, in, in collaborations with others. So I think mm -hmm. it's 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 wonderful to see things from a different perspective and, and to try to you know, 
achieve synergy uh, of, of combining fields, you know, that, that have not previously, you know, intersected before. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's, it's hugely important and I approach it with great humility because I know that I don't know the answer and that's, what, that's why I show up to work every day. Mm -hmm. So trying to learn from everybody around me. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great way to put it. We know in psychiatry as well that we're so far from having the, the, the bedrock of understanding that we need to, to really design uh, precisely targeted uh, uh, treatments. We're getting there, but we know we have a long way to go. And the brain, it's, there's no, not an organ in, in the body that needs as much interdisciplinary cooperation as the brain. It's, it's uh, genetically the most complex in terms of the gene expression profiles. It's anatomically the most complex in terms of the number of cell types and their interconnections. And from an engineering perspective, it's by far the most complex with the, the s tiny signals that are fast and intertwined and, and uh, vulnerable elements that go together to make the circuit. It, it couldn't be more requiring of interdisciplinary work. And just to look at that and realize <laughs> no one person has all that, that knowledge. And, and that was my perspective from the beginning. And, and, launching the laboratory in a bioengineering department. I'm not an engineer, but I'm in a bioengineering department uh, intentionally knowing that there's so many different perspectives that need to be brought together under the same roof, mm -hmm. not just knowing of each other, but really together mm -hmm. uh, to make headway. And that comes with challenges. Of course, you put engineers and doctors and biologists in a room and sometimes they don't know how to communicate necessarily very well with each other. They might not even like each other very much. And, <laughs> and, and so there it's get people past that initial energy barrier of learning how to talk to each other, learning how to appreciate each other's unique perspective, what you can bring. And I find if I, one of my roles is to, is to help get people past that initial awkwardness and uh, get them to a point where the information and the understanding flows. Just as a quick follow-up question to this, when you first sit down with an idea of a project with all these different people, how do you know that it's going to be successful? Maybe you don't, I don't know, but is there a way to be able to see the end result potentially? I, I think what we know is what questions are really important and need mm. to be answered and and we have hypotheses about ways to answer those questions mm. and and so you know it's always a dialogue with the trainees in the lab with the staff in the lab with our collaborators um, I think if there's a, a exciting question, people come to the table and, and work together to try to answer it mm. and then soon soon after beginning the project, you start to know you know, if it's moving forward in a way that is informative, it may or may not support your hypothesis, but if you're learning something from it, then, then it's a project with legs. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. And also, I will say, sometimes if something is new enough, and if it has enough intrinsic uh, appeal, it's maybe worth doing anyway, even if it is really unlikely to work. Um, and, and that might... Um, it's not quite as simple as that. Of course, you, you have to think about what is the, what is something that we're going to get out of it. But if it's something is new enough, you'll get something from it. You know, you'll, you'll have an insight that couldn't have come about before. And so I, that's one perspective I try to, uh, you know, share with my, uh, the people in my lab is, is if uh, a potential project has a certain, uh, looking at, at the new part of the sky with a, with a telescope uh, in a way that it hasn't been looked at before. You should just do it. And, and, and if, there's a, if something's new enough and beautiful enough, um, try it. I mean, I think that the, the challenge that we you know, try to teach our students is, is to ask questions in a way that you will discover new truth. Now, it may not support the hypothesis that you set out Mm -hmm. you know, to, to test. But if you design your experiment so that no matter what you find, you've learned something important, mm -hmm. um, then there's always a reason to move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, sort of just one more follow-up question to that. Obviously, you know, you guys are both at these very interdisciplinary labs. Um, how do you kind of manage the scope of what your lab is doing, right? And I'm thinking particularly of you, Dr. Dysarth, but also 
you know, kind of clinical versus basic science, engineering, all these different aspects? Well, it is, um, there is a unified perspective that guides things. And you're right, it, it could easily, you know, biology is, is, is complex and wonderful and you could explore many things and, and without some unifying vision, things could get a little bit uh, out of control. Right. And uh, for me, I'm interested in how the brain works as an intact system, how the different parts of the brain negotiate to what's allowed into the brain state of the moment, what's kept out of it. And for me, that's so interesting because it, it's just by itself it's interesting, it's fundamentally cool, right. but also it could explain so much of psychiatric and neurological uh, you know, symptoms if we understood that more deeply. And so that's our unifying theme. And we approach that from many angles, but we, we don't just develop any methodology, we develop a methodology that will help us with that unifying question. And uh, that's, that's basically it. I think that, um, and then the lab is, you know, it, it grows in directions it needs to, to grow to achieve that goal. Um, all right, moving forward with a couple more leadership-focused questions um, for this Lasker session. What are some of the most difficult decisions that you've had to make in your careers, and how did you go about navigating those? It can be scientific or academic, personal. You know, from a personal perspective, um, I think one of the most difficult challenges in trying to do many different things at the same time was prioritizing which ones to focus on at that moment without letting the other ones go. I, I you know, advice that I, I got very early in my career was you can do everything but maybe not at the same time. And so there was a large chunk of my career setting up my lab, you know, setting up my clinical program. There was also the time that, you know, we were having our children. And um, you know, I was I was pregnant for a lot of a decade. We have you know, <laughs> we have we have uh, I've, I've given birth to four children, and so um, that was it was challenging to keep all of the pieces moving forward in a in a way that had sufficient momentum, prioritizing what had to be prioritized at that moment. And, and that required me to really believe in myself that even though it appeared as though I was focusing on other things, that I knew I was going to carry my scientific program forward, that I knew I was going to be able to balance everything, even when, you know, both implicitly and explicitly, the message I was getting from those around me was, well, it looks like you've made some life choices that, you know, take you away from, from academic medicine. And I would think, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not making those choices. I'm, I'm choosing to make a new human being right now. And, you know, right. I, I, will, I will get that paper out next year, you know. Um, so, so just sort of, you know, seeing the long vision and, and staying kind of true to that was um, a challenge for, for many years, but um, worked out in the end. So I, I guess the message is sort of perseverance and, and believing in what you, know, you see as the, the path of your career, not what others might perceive at that moment that you're doing. How do you kind of go about communicating that to other people? You know, particularly kind of like in the example that you just brought up. Yeah, I, I, I'm very open about the fact that I'm a mom and that that's really important to me and that, um, that you can focus and, and do you know important science and also see patients at the same time as prioritizing you know making dinner for your kids and so I'm really I talk about it with my trainees all the time I, I actually start almost every lecture uh, which is, usually starts with a broad consideration of neurodevelopment with baby pictures of our kids and and kind of talk about neurodevelopmental processes because it's a great intro but also because I, I want the trainees in the audience to know that I have kids and, and I'm very open about that, that it, it was okay. Because mm -hmm. the message that I got when I was early in my career was that it was a choice, that you could either have a successful, you know, big career in, in academic medicine and science or you could choose to be a parent. And, and the two are absolutely not mutually exclusive. It does take some balance, it does take some sacrifice, but it is completely possible and I think it's important to kind of demonstrate that. Um, and 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 I, I you know try very hard when I when I visit 
institutions, when I meet with groups of trainees especially, to open myself up to those kinds of questions. We can talk about you know, neuroscience, we can talk about uh, pediatric neuro-oncology, or we can talk about balancing parenthood and, and you know, science and, and sort of that work-life balance and whatever questions people want to ask. And really, it's usually a, a really nice mixture of the two. Yeah, I, I also try to be very uh, open about, you know, I'm going to pick up the kids, and I, I say that to my students and, and postdocs, trying to role model that this is, this is important, this is normal. Um, the other, to your question, the other hard choice, I think, that we both had to make was, as MD-PhD, you know, practicing physicians, do we continue mm -hmm. seeing patients uh, mm -hmm. or not? And if we do, how to do it? Do we, and, both of us made the decision, uh, despite all the you know, potential challenges, to keep seeing patients. And, uh, you know, Michelle sees patients more than I do. It's a, a bigger part of her life, but it's actually growing on my side, too, even, even now. And that was, that was a, it's, it's a choice that is very personal, very uh, in, individual. For some people, it's the right choice to take the medical training that's a given, that's a nice foundation, and, and, and go on and do pure research. But for both of us, it was, uh, it, it really mattered to keep seeing patients, and we're, and we're both seeing that it's, it's helping us in our science, and it's helping us uh, uh, in, in to, in, to advance medicine as well. And um, I'm really glad we did it. I understand it's, it's not uh, a path open to everybody, but I would encourage the, the students um, the MD, PhD students to uh, to really uh, think hard before giving it up. That there's uh, you, you may not, although it's hard, you may not see all the uh, potential opportunities right away, but they'll come and they'll be big later. So if you can stick it out. Yeah. And just to echo words that you used earlier, it really grounds your science in, in such an important way to, to continue to see patients. It really frames and focuses the scientific questions you need to ask. And it's important to bring those, your, your lab perspectives back to the clinic, too. I, I think this is an excellent segue to our next question, mm -hmm. which does, well, first off, I just want to say thank you. Uh, your words are very moving. Um, but one of the reasons why we wanted to interview you both together was that you are a married couple with a demanding career, with five children. There's a lot on your plate. And it sounds like, you know, we, we've heard a little bit about your past. But what about today? What, what does your average day look like? <laughs> and someone asked recently, how do you get through breakfast? We could start with today. You want to start with today? <laughs> sure. Today was already interesting. Today yeah. has been interesting, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think maybe one first principle is that every day is different. And okay. so, um, you know, we kind of strategize a little bit the night before. You know, who's going to do pickups? Who's going to do drop-offs? What deviation from the norm, you know, which is the norm <laughs> to deviate, uh, needs to happen. Um, so part of it is just collaboration. Yeah. And, and today is interesting, you know, Michelle's on calls today uh, and has been, uh, and, and so fielding, you know, acute, very serious uh, medical issues at the same time as, as running her lab and as, as we get the kids, uh, you know, off to school, all that's going on. Today I, uh, uh, actually today I opened up a new uh, clinical research room in the hospital. We had our first patient in there and there was a lot of very interesting uh, work going on. But all that against the backdrop of the of the, the kids, and so you know, woke up you know reasonably early, you know, made breakfast, made lunches, but you know, um, it's a uh, and as Michelle said, a lot of communication, a lot of uh, treating each day like a new uh, a new puzzle, and we solve it together. Um, yeah, that's I think that's part of the uh, the perspective that's important is is. Flexibility, elasticity, realizing that uh, uh, things have to shift and and be um, malleable on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Yeah, and learning how to multitask really well mm. is <laughs> a, a key skill. <laughs> how how do you sustain success as a couple? Uh, I really like him. Okay, so that's I, good. <laughs> so that helps. <laughs> it's a good starting point. <laughs> yeah. Well. 
in addition to that, uh, <laughs> uh, which is important, um, and I really like Michelle too, so, but I will say that she's also an, you know, kind of a role model for me because I, I didn't do as much clinical work early on in my career. I was seeing patients, but it was uh, not nearly as much and as, not nearly as important as the work she did. But I was watching her and seeing the, the impact she was having and the, her dedication, and I thought, I'm under, I'm, I'm, I'm not fully, you know, leveraging what I could do. I'm, I'm actually not honoring all the, the training, everything that's, that's gone into my career so far. And look at what Michelle, look at what she's doing. And wow, and so, so that, I learned a lot from that and I'm shifting a little bit, in, uh, or actually quite a bit recently in that direction. And that, to be inspired by the person you, uh, you live with is pretty good. Mm -hmm. It, it goes without saying that Carl's pretty inspiring too. So. <laughs> Maybe one last follow-up question with this topic. Um, you do have children, and you are teaching them every day. As as you kind of as you look into the future and see where science is moving, what what are some things that you teach your children, whether or not they want to go into science? How do you best prepare a rising generation of scholars? I mean, you know, we we talk about science quite a bit in our house as you might um, mm -hmm. as you might imagine um, the kids have amazingly interesting questions as kids do and you know Carl's especially wonderful at, at um, you know explaining to them kind of the fundamental principles of physics and chemistry that ex you know answer their questions but I think teaching them that that you know there's a process to answering questions and to seek truth and and a way to learn how to do that is a big part of what I think we we you know try to instill in them. Um, our oldest um, is is actually an MD PhD student. I'm incredibly proud of him. Not everybody in the family might go in this path, but so far it has seemed to be kind of the family business. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. We we often uh, uh, just talking about things in the world, uh, you know, phenomena of nature. Uh, I'll find myself using almost. Uh, in addition to sharing the joy of, oh, how, that's cool, how does that work? I'll find myself also using almost scientific constructions of how to, how to think about it, how to talk about it, how to ask the, the right questions about it if you're interested in, in how it works. And to see how quickly the kids pick that up is pretty amazing and to see them use that in their own uh, life. So we, we uh, that take nothing away from just the, the wonder of, of being alive and, and, and all the, the amazing things in nature, but also to give them a way to, to say, hey, I, I, could, I don't have to just accept it. I can, I can dive deeper. I can explore it. And, and that's, it's really fun to, to give kids the, the, the power to ask those questions. I mean, they're going to ask questions anyway, but to, to, to help them frame their curiosity is really... Uh, uh, it's an amazing experience. Thank you. All right, so our final prepared question for you before we go to questions from the chat is, what are you most excited about lately in your own research? This can be as broad or specific as you want. <laughs> um, you know, my, my research is focused kind of on the intersection of fields, as we've talked about earlier, um, really trying to understand how cancers that occur in the brain take advantage of you know, neuroscience principles and, and direct interactions with, with the nervous system, um, and how we can you know, use that to not only understand the disease, but to actually learn from the cancer and understand you know, what are the processes of development and plasticity that the cancer is taking advantage of that informs normal uh, learning and memory and, and cognition. Um, and, and I think we're just at the beginning of, of understanding this sort of interdisciplinary you know, direction. There's, there's just an enormous amount of therapeutic potential um, that remains untapped, but that I see the promise in. Um, we're, we're learning, it feels like an exponential amount about these interactions every day. And, and as we try to you know, appreciate all the things about brain cancers that have been so difficult to understand 
until now. From this lens, it's beginning to make sense, including the way that the nervous system is able to successfully or unsuccessfully fight the cancer in the context of, of the brain and spinal cord, including um, the patterns of progression and spread, including some of the, the patient experiences that have been, and symptoms that have been harder to understand. And so I, I, I feel very excited that in going in this direction, that, that we and others in the field are gonna really begin to sort of break open what has seemed to be you know, this intractable, um, intractable puzzle. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about our work right now and, and the work that I see happening you know, broadly in this area. What's interesting is, the, for me, the most exciting aspects right now are on completely different spatial scales, where I mentioned the clinical work we're doing, and this is you know, brain-wide recording, listening in on the activity of cells all across the brain during altered states, during complex cognitions. We're doing this work in human beings, and then we're trying to do exactly as much as we can those same things in laboratory animals and looking for shared properties, shared principles. That's an amazing uh, direction that we haven't been able to do before and it's just we've just turned the corner on that it's incredibly exciting at the same time we're continuing to develop and discover these uh, amazing proteins from nature these genes encoding proteins that are light activated regulators of ion flow this is the the uh, the key type of molecule for optogenetics and there's a whole part of my lab that's completely invested in understanding the exact, you know, angstrom level positioning of, of, you know, atoms and amino acid residues that govern the function of these beautiful molecules and work. The whole part of my lab is discovering them, getting the high resolution structures, making them better, making them different. And I started in biochemistry and for me that's as, as thrilling as the, the systems level human brain function. And the amazing thing is they actually help each other. That's, that's the crazy thing is, you know, the working on the positioning of this atom is helping us really directly in the same lab understand aspects of how the human brain is working. Um, so just seeing those threads come together in a really unified way is, is pretty exciting. Yeah, finding the synchronicity, kind of finding how things, how things function together. Well, you guys sound like you have extremely exciting and busy lives to go from meetings about angstrom level things to interacting with patients and thinking about the future of your research. Um, thank you so much. So we'll now take a few questions from the chat. I think John will lead us off with those. Yes, we do actually have some that have come in. And um, please, we'd encourage you, if you do have a question, please feel free to put that into the chat. Um, so the question that came in is about mentorship. Have you had any notable mentors throughout your life? And what are some philosophies that you have on what makes a good mentor? I mean, I think I've been very lucky to have really wonderful mentors at every stage of my career. Um, and I think what makes mentorship, you know, I think the principles of mentorship that, you know, have been really important for me and that I try to provide to, to the people that I have the opportunity to mentor is, is number one to um, you know teach people how how to ask questions how to how to find the answers and how to ask the questions and, and to teach them that you know to have the confidence that they're asking the right things you know so to, to believe in themselves to to know that they have the tool set to answer these questions and to succeed um, and and how to navigate that while still being a happy you know well-rounded person <laughs> Yeah, me mentorship is is an ongoing process in life. I've, I'm getting mentored these days as much as ever by uh, amazing people. For example, as we grow our clinical side, I'm I'm learning so much from clinical folks, including Michelle, but other other folks who are so wise and 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 uh, on that side of things. And I try to give back as much as I can. Um, a mentor could be anybody. A mentor is anybody who who is honest and and. Uh, willing to talk and and this is a uh, you know a community of, of mentors effectively is, is sort of how I see the uh, our passage in science uh, through through life in science 
and I try to give back as much as I can. Any potential interaction is a potential opportunity for mentorship. Uh, pe you know, people that I meet at a conference, elevator conversation. Uh, a lot of discussions actually with the, the book you mentioned, projections, people who have read the book come and ask um, or send me questions about um, that are effectively mentorship questions. How do I uh, navigate uh, a path? Uh, I'm interested in writing. I'm interested in science. I'm interested in, in, in medicine. And I try to provide um, feedback as much as I can, uh, even if it's not a, a traditional uh, mentorship role. Do you have any advice about for mentees like myself, how they can best support the mentor? Mm. Maybe do the work, but in, in addition no, to that. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I think it, it, it should be said how um, mutually beneficial the mentor-mentee relationship is. And just as Carl said, sometimes the mentee is the mentor. Mm. You know, I think, you know, the questions asked, the observations made, the insights, it, it's, you know, I learn as much from my students, I think, as they learn from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. The, the, so you may think your mentor is, uh, knows everything they need to know, but it's not true. <laughs> I can <laughs> promise you that. So, uh, yeah, just share, share your knowledge, share your wisdom. It's, it's going to be very appreciated and very important. Um, Thank you. Um, there's another question that came into the chat. Um, it seems like you both are uh, very involved with social media and communicating about your science to the community. Do you have any um, comments about science communication and maybe even your role as scientists in promoting um, scientific principles and ideas to the broader community? It's a great question. Um, you know. I see social media as, as, a, as a way to you know, express excitement about discoveries in the literature, as a way to also communicate about our own discoveries and you know, kind of clear you know, language that, that is understandable. I think it's really, it's really important not just to make a discovery, but to make that knowledge available to people. And sometimes making that knowledge available means you know, not using Greek and Latin, but you know, actually just explaining it in a word or an animated short or a cartoon um, you know, that, that conveys the, the discovery, that conveys the, the principle without, um, you know, in, in easily understandable language. So I think that's, it's, it's, it's our responsibility to communicate the discoveries as much as it is to make them. Yeah, that's right. My, my personal perspective, I know there are a lot of different ways of approaching social media. I don't think it's a great way to have a conversation. My, that's my perspective. I, I don't find it's a good way to get deep and get honest. And you know, I think, but I think, as Michelle said, it is a great way to just say, "Hey, here's here's something that people should know about," and uh, here it is in clear terms uh, and accessible uh, uh, phrases. That I think is as much the the mission of a scientist as, as anything to 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 share with everybody, literally everybody what's been found. Thank you. I actually just had a, a question to kind of interject here since we're talking about science communication and you did bring up your book. Um, how did you decide in all of your free time that that was a project that you wanted to, to do? Um, and kind of what <coughs> feedback or what kind of conversations have you had with people based on that? Yeah. Really public? This is, I, I'd always wanted to be a writer from early on. So it was something that was always a thread in my life and in some ways the book took 20 years to write because I was I'd started to write stories uh, that became the, the backbone of the book uh, early on in my residency training and over the years I would I would write if I heard an interesting phrase or thought of an interesting word I would write it down if there was an anecdote about a patient I would write it down and uh, but of course, you know, I was busy in science. There was a lot going on, and I didn't quite ever buckle down and say, I'm going to write a book. Um, but uh, things started to come together in, in uh, the, the last few years. Um, I, it wasn't so much a conscious decision, but it was sort of the sense that maybe with how far the science had come and with the perspective that we actually do know in a physical sense 
the connections, the projections that underlie major processes in the brain that people care about and that go wrong in disease, that it was the time to share these things with everybody, literally everybody. And so I buckled down and started <laughs> really trying to write, and it took a few years at the end, and then a burst of activity, about a year of very intense writing. Um, you know, I, I tried to carve out about two hours a day. Uh, Usually you, from like one to three a.m., <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> Which is, that's the best time to write, actually, uh, fortuitously, because that's when you're most, at least when I'm most uh, creative, because I'm, I've, I've cast aside the, uh, the strictures of, of academic writing and thinking, and I, I allowed myself to be, have a little, more of a literary sensibility, and actually helps to, to, to be a little... Uh, disengage from your daytime job, and but it, it was hard. Um, but it was also incredibly rewarding. I, I would be so excited in the course of the day when I would suddenly think of a, a word or a phrase that I thought was pretty, and I I couldn't wait to go home and, and write. And there were some hard decisions though to make. You know, anytime you you write, you have to first of all ask what is the voice? What am I trying to do here? Really, what's the style? I knew for me. An absolute red line was I had to be uh, completely true to the science, that I, I wasn't going to dumb anything down, I wasn't going to bend the truth at all. And that it wasn't always obvious how to take that path and truly communicate with everybody, which was my other goal. I didn't want it to just be for, you know, scientists, because I thought this was something that needed to be shared with everybody. So that was the the thread to navigate. And interestingly enough, psychiatry was, I think, the glue that brought it together because this is something everybody, everybody thinks a little bit or a lot about how their brain works and how people in their family, their friends, things that work well, things that don't work well. People see that, they think about it, they care about it, they wonder about it, they're curious about it. And it was that, uh, that was the bridge and allowed me to, I think, to tell things in a, an accessible way that also stayed true to the science. Um, so that was the, that was the challenge, that was the path taken, but it was, it was also very liberating. So for anybody who's thinking about writing, um, scientists or doctors, it can be really uh, a transformative personal experience. You can discover things about yourself. Uh, I saw themes in the book that weren't clear to me until the book was written, and they were themes about my life. And so it's a, it's a process of discovery. And then it was also, uh, in a way, it helped my understanding of my patients too, because I would, in each chapter, each chapter in the book is, a, is focused on a different domain of psychiatry. And in the chapter on schizophrenia, I allowed myself to, to write in a sort of a fragmented way, in ways that uh, I, uh, mimicked aspects of the thought disorder and the thought blocking that happen in schizophrenia. And in the manic, the bipolar chapter, I allowed myself to, to write in sort of an exuberant uh, uh, style that captured aspects of the uh, emotions of, of, of mania. And that process helped me really connect with my patients more as well, trying to inhabit that space even more than I had before. So I think it made me a better doctor as well in the end. It's really fascinating to hear you discuss kind of how you how you wrote each of those chapters in the, the different kind of style. Um, I know when I was reading the book and I read the section about um, back when you're a resident, I think treating a patient, a little girl with DIPG, and then realizing that you ended up being married to kind of a, an expert in that um, specific condition. It's yeah, it's really an interesting way that life kind of comes full circle, I suppose. Yeah, that, uh, that connection uh, was very meaningful for, for both of us to see. We do have another question in the chat. Um, how do you balance seeking high impact findings versus clinically meaningful or necessary research routes? Well, they're not mutually exclusive. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think, again, the, the, we, personally, I follow the science. And sometimes that results in a, a discovery that is, you know, somewhat incremental, but really practically important. And that's an important thing to do. And sometimes you follow the science and you realize there's a huge 
unanswered question. Mm -hmm. And that ends up being a little bit more of a, you know, big impact, um, you know, scientific, you know, publication or project. Um, and they're both really important, and they're also not mutually exclusive. So, you know, again, just I follow where the questions take us. I think that's right. We, one, I think we don't, also in my lab, we don't frame things that way. You know, this is going to be high impact or this is not. It's more... If there is a unifying theme in project selection, it's what what wouldn't get done if we didn't do it. I think that's 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 a, a theme we try to adhere to. We're not interested in winning a, a race to something because it would be done anyway. So so why do it? Um, and that that I think is is valuable. It's not so much about impact. It's about uh, how can we take this opportunity, this moment in time, the uh, you know and make the most of it. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And the uh, one, one other question that came in is, how do you go about finding advocates for your research career versus mentors that you found along your path? Maybe this, I think, goes back to a little bit to our previous discussion earlier. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interest, It's an important distinction. Um, advocates for your research career can mm -hmm. come from many different sources, as can mentors along the path. And so it's it's wonderful if if that you know it's in the same person and it's somebody that you trained with, and that's one way to find a great both mentor and advocate. But but sometimes it can just be, you know, somebody that you meet um, at a scientific meeting or in the clinic who you establish a good relationship with and you, you maintain lines of communication and when it comes time for you know advice you reach out to them, when it comes time to apply for a job, they could write you a very strong recommendation because they, or, or make some phone calls or advocate for you because they, they've gotten to know you along the way. So I think, I think those people can be found you know, both in your own laboratories um, but also, or in the laboratories that you join, but also um, you know, elsewhere in your professional lives. And I, I try to stay as accessible as possible. I know it's not always easy, but as Michelle said, it could be someone that you could be an encounter in the clinic at a scientific meeting. Um, uh, uh, conversations that establish that that this is an opportunity for advocacy could happen anytime. And uh, um, I look for those opportunities to help advocate for, for people. So. Um, now it can be, it's not always, it's easier said than done, right? How do you, how do you strike up those conversations and, and all that? Um, but um, again, if I could pass that on to the uh, students, I think certainly we and I think maybe many more people than you might think are, are really looking for opportunities to advocate and help. Absolutely. Thank you both for giving us the opportunity to ask you all of these questions. Um, we've really enjoyed our conversation here today. And these answers really help give us insight, I think, into your science, but also your lives in and outside of the lab and sort of how those things are all quite intertwined. Um, so now it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Claire Pomeroy, the president of the Lasker Foundation, to present you with these awards in recognition of your time here today. What a fantastic interview. And uh, thank you, all four of you, for a great conversation. On behalf of the Lasker Foundation, I am pleased to present you with these little mementos of our day. And um, I really want to say that you are a science power couple. You are role models for our students and for me. And I thank you for doing that and for all the impact that your science has, all the difference that it's making for patients, making the world a healthier place. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to invite everybody to join us for our upcoming Lasker Lessons in Leadership program. It will feature Dr. Dennis Lowe, the 2022 Lasker Award winner for non-invasive prenatal testing using fetal DNA to diagnose Down syndrome. He's gone on to use circulating DNA in all sorts of fascinating fields. That will be May 16th, 2024. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much for a wonderful interview. Thank you.